Narcissism and vanity characterize the spirit of our age, particularly when it comes to social media, where we're tempted to promote ourselves, make ourselves look good, and present a certain image of ourselves to the world. But when faced with the glory of God, Scripture calls upon us to exhibit a different attitude, humility. What does it mean to be truly humble? What does it mean to humble oneself before the Lord? And if we're serious about giving all glory to God, what should this look like in the Christian life? In this special edition of our podcast, we bring to you the audio from the recent lecture Professor David Van Drunen gave for the Center on the Glory of True Humility. As with other live events, we've left off the question and answer portion of the event. If you'd like to participate in the Q&A in the future, we'd love to have you attend our event or register to get the media. I hope that you'll enjoy what you hear and find it beneficial to your Christian life. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Moore College, and welcome to the first of our events for the evening for the Center for Christian Living. It's a real pleasure to have you here with us. This year, we've dedicated our live events to exploring a virtuous life. In the Apostle Peter's second letter, he encourages believers to make every effort to supplement their faith with virtue. And so we've committed these four evenings of this year for our CCL events to exploring that virtuous life in greater detail. One of the classic virtues is humility. And for the next hour, we have the privilege of considering a biblical vision of humility. Unlike our more practically oriented, typical events that will be displayed later on this evening at 7.30, this hour is intended as a lecture. And before introducing our speaker this evening, we'll begin by hearing 2 Peter 1 and this list of virtues that Peter lays out for us with the charge to put on these virtues. So listen, please, to the word of God. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you both from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In response to what I've just read in and in anticipation of what we're about to hear, would you please join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, what a great privilege it is to meet this evening and to consider that great virtue of humility, the one that was so wonderfully displayed to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and served in perfect obedience even unto death. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus' example of selflessness and of the model that he's given to us of how we might consider one another and love each other now as we live our lives in Christ. Please, would you open our ears and our hearts to consider your word this evening and to consider this great virtue of humility. We pray, Lord, that you would bless David as he speaks to us, that he would do so clearly and faithfully in a way that will edify us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our speaker this evening is the Robert B. Strimple, Professor of Systematic Theology and Christian Ethics at Westminster Seminary, California. It's Professor David Van Drunen. I've been really grateful to know David for a number of years now and have benefited immensely from his writing as a scholar. He's written many books, especially focusing 
most of his attention on a recovery of natural law within the Reformed tradition, although he's written much more widely than that as well. But I've benefited immensely both from his theology and from his ethics, and I'm very glad to be having him here this evening sharing with us. I also just want to give thanks to Mark Thompson, our principal, who kindly was willing to invite David and to host him here for a few weeks to run these events. Now, without any further ado, we'll get on to our program, and I'd ask you to please join me in welcoming Professor David Van Drunen. Thank you, Chase, and it's really nice to be here. Thank you for coming out. I'm grateful for the invitation and for the hospitality that has already been shown to me. So we are thinking about humility and there's a certain sense in which the two lectures that I'm giving this evening are in backwards order. Later this evening, we'll be thinking about why virtue? What is virtue? Why virtue? This one, we'll be thinking about a particular virtue. But I think when we planned it, it made sense for the way we're doing it. So you'll have to take my word for it that virtue is a good thing. And if you're unsure about that, then please come back in a couple of hours and we'll think about that a little bit more. So humility, it's a word that we're all familiar with, and yet there are a lot of layers of complexity to this idea. Now, many of you may know that a number of virtues that we recognize as Christians were also recognized by the ancient classical philosophers. Maybe not exactly the same form, but we use the same kind of words and in some sense, a lot of the same ideas. But humility is not one of those virtues. In fact, if we would look, for example, at Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, we would see his long account of the virtue of magnanimity. And in his description of the magnanimous person, well, I should say magnanimous man, because it would only be a man who would be magnanimous in Aristotle's view. The magnanimous man was a great man, and he knew it, and he acted like it. He conducted himself in a way that elevated himself above the common run of person and held the common person in a kind of contempt. For Aristotle, it would be shameful for a great man to act like a humble man. But with Christianity a very, very different view of humility arose. At the same time, I think we would want to say that even apart from the Christian religion, humility is immensely appropriate for a human being. You think about it for a moment. What human being who is not honest would not recognize that he or she is very ignorant is very weak, very vulnerable, is but a tiny speck in a giant universe, and ultimately is accountable to a a divine being much greater than he or she is. So I think we could say that humility ought to be even a natural virtue that every human being ought to have. And yet, I would like to suggest this evening that there is a distinctively Christian humility that goes beyond merely recognizing your smallness before a great God and within a vast universe. This is the definition that I would like to propose for Christian humility, and I will try to defend that as we move along. Here is my basic definition. Christian humility is a disposition of Christ-like service and deference toward fellow Christians that accepts loss and doesn't seek one's own earthly honor and recognition for it. Now, it's a common theme in classical Christian moral thought that Christ is the model of Christian humility. That if we want to understand how we should be humble, we need to look to Christ who was humble. But let me pose a provocative question. Was Christ really humble? Now, if we think of it in terms of what I mentioned a moment ago, in terms of one's smallness and recognizing one's ignorance and one's weakness and one's vulnerability, we might think of the Lord Jesus Christ for a moment and remember that he was true God. 
from all eternity, the second person of the Trinity. We might remember that as he undertook his earthly ministry, he stilled the stormy sea. He made the blind to see. He rose people from the dead. He called people to trust in him, and he called people to worship him. Now, all of those things he was fully justified in doing. But humble is probably not the first word that comes to mind to describe those things. And so we might wonder, is it really accurate to say that Christ was humble, at least if we think of it in terms of recognizing one's smallness and ignorance and weakness? Yet we have to acknowledge Christ as humble because Scripture says that so clearly. We might think, for example, in the Old Testament, the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 9 verse 9, prophesied of a coming Messiah who would ride on a donkey, humble. And of course, this is what our Lord Jesus did in his triumphal entry. We might think of Matthew 11 verse 29, in which Jesus, in those remarkable words, calls people to come to him because his yoke is easy, his burden is light. He calls people to come to him as one who is gentle and humble in soul. And we might think of Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, when he says that Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. And so we must say that Christ was humble But there must have been some distinctive way that Christ was humble that transcends a mere acknowledgement of weakness, ignorance, or vulnerability. And I would like to also point out then that especially as we think about Philippians 2, it is very clear that whatever was distinctive about Christ's humility is in fact what ought to mark Christian humility. In Philippians 2, 1 through 5, I'm going to come back to Philippians 2, 1 through 5 in a moment, and I'll be making most of my remarks from that text. In Philippians 2, 1 through 5, Paul calls Christians to conduct themselves in a certain way, to conduct themselves in love for one another, in deference towards one another, seeking the good of others. And at the center of Paul's exhortations there in Philippians 2, verse 3, He says, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. So he calls Christians to have humility there. And then immediately after this, Paul turns and calls us to have the mind of Christ. And then he describes Christ for us and says that Christ humbled himself. The most obvious link between the exhortations to Christians and their conduct in verses 1 through 5 And the description of Christ's conduct in verses 6 through 9 is humility. And so it is worth our while to think first about Christ's humility. And then we can come back and to contemplate what that means for our own humility as Christians. Well, one thing that we must note as we consider Philippians 2, 6, particularly verses 6 through 8, Paul says that Christ lowered himself from a position of the highest exaltation to a position of the lowest servitude. Verse 7, Paul says that Christ emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. In verse 6, he had said that he was in the form of God. This is a way in which Paul expresses the fact that The Lord Jesus Christ from all eternity is the true son of God. And yet he emptied himself and took the form of a servant. But what kind of service was it that Christ undertook? Well, in a sense, you might say, well, he came to be a servant to his father. They say, yeah, that's accurate. That's true. But actually, He especially came to be a servant to us. I mean, you think about it. His father did not really need Christ to be a servant to him. We needed Christ to be a servant to us. When Christ came in a form of a servant, he came to be a servant to us sinners. 
So it's not just that Christ came to serve some high and exalted beings, which you might say would be a form of honor to be a servant to a great person, but Christ became a servant to us, sinners who deserved his wrath. That is remarkable. And here you might think of Mark 10, verse 45, in which Jesus says of himself, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now I point that out, not only because there also Christ speaks of himself becoming a servant, but you notice how he says of himself, he became a servant to give his life as a ransom. Well, who needed to be ransomed? in the ancient world. Well, you needed to be ransomed if you were a slave. You needed to be purchased out of slavery. Christ became a servant to serve slaves. That is the lowest form of servitude that one could imagine. Christ became a servant to inferiors. What else is involved in this servitude that Christ rendered? Well, in Philippians 2 verse 8, We find that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And one way I would put this is that in becoming a servant, he accepted unjust loss. There was only one person in the history of this world who did not deserve to die. And that was our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he came to die. He came to die for those people that he came to serve. His death was unjust. He was condemned for sins he did not commit. He was slandered. He was beaten. He was publicly ridiculed. All of that was unjust. He suffered and accepted that unjust loss. That was a crucial part of his servitude. And that leads to another characteristic, a final characteristic I would like to mention of Christ's humility as described here in Philippians 2. And that is that he was content to receive recompense for his loss only in eschatological glory. It's one thing to accept unjust loss if you think you might get it back tomorrow or next week, or maybe next year. Christ never received recompense for his loss in this life. He went all the way to death, to the death of the cross, never having received justice for what he suffered. It was only, as Paul goes on to say in the following verses, verses 9 through 11, only following his death that God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. He was willing to wait and to receive his recompense, to receive his great reward in eschatological glory. So those are the characteristics, I would suggest, of Christ's humility. He lowered himself into a position of servitude. He became a servant to inferiors. He accepted unjust loss. And he was willing to receive his recompense only in eschatological glory. I want to pause for a moment before turning and considering Christian humility in light of Christ's humility. I would like to suggest that this revelation of the humility of the Messiah, it really should not have caught God's people by surprise because there was a great Old Testament type of our Lord Jesus and his humility. Maybe there are more than just what I have in mind, but I want to point out to you Moses. Maybe that was not the person you would expect me to say. Moses was a great type foreshadowing the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ. And In order to make this point, I want to turn back in the Old Testament to Numbers chapter 12. And we can turn back to Philippians 2 in a couple of minutes. Now, perhaps you remember the story in Numbers chapter 12, 
It's a story when Moses' own siblings, Aaron and Miriam, rise up in opposition to him and challenge his authority. Now, it's one thing when other people oppose you. It's another thing when your brother and sister do it. And this is the story in Numbers chapter 12. And after Numbers 12 introduces this basic storyline, the text says this, Numbers 12, verse 3, Now the man Moses was very meek. That's how my translation has it, but humble is a very good translation of this Hebrew word. The man Moses was very humble, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. It's a statement that seems to come out of nowhere. It hasn't necessarily struck us by this point in the Old Testament narrative that Moses was an especially humble man, particularly the most humble person on the face of the earth. And the text doesn't offer further comment on it. It says it, and it just seems to go on to other things. And we're left wondering, in what sense was Moses humble? Not just a little humble, but magnificently humble, if we can use that almost oxymoronic way of speaking. A thing that's remarkable about this is that it seems quite clear from New Testament perspective that this statement about Moses was meant to foreshadow our Lord Jesus Christ. And there are at least two texts that make that pretty clear. One is Matthew 11, which I mentioned earlier. The end of Matthew 11 portrays Jesus as humble. Actually, Jesus portrays himself as humble it seems quite clear that he is drawing on mosaic imagery. He is portraying himself as a kind of a new and better Moses. And then also in Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews 3 actually draws explicitly on this text in Numbers 3, speaking about how Moses was faithful in all God's house, which draws on this text. And then says, but Jesus was faithful as a son over the house. So again, the New Testament looks back on Numbers 12 and sees in Moses a foreshadowing of Christ who would be even better and even better leader of God's people than Moses. So we have good reason this evening to pay some special attention to Numbers 12, at least to give it a few minutes of our time. In what sense was Moses humble? Well, if we look a few verses later in Numbers chapter 12, we find that God gives Moses a special title here in this chapter. In verse 6, God calls Moses a prophet. That's a great title. But then in verse 7, he gives him a second title. He calls him my servant Moses. My servant, Moses. I hope that sounds familiar from Philippians chapter 2. Moses was the servant of the Lord. Think about how Moses was a servant and consider how much it looks like Christ's service. Moses, he started his life, well, maybe not the first few months of his life, But following the first few months of his life, till he was about 40 years old, he lived a life of high power and privilege. He was raised in the court of Pharaoh, in the royal court of perhaps the most powerful empire of the world at that time. And yet Moses, by his own choice, identified with his own people, the Israelites, who were slaves and suffering terribly. And because he identified with them, he was driven out of Egypt and for 40 years became a shepherd looking after sheep in the desert. Now, no offense to any shepherds who may be here. It is, I assume, an honorable vocation, although I know really nothing about it. I once preached on Jesus' parable about the man with a hundred sheep from Matthew 18 And I made some comments and an elderly gentleman came up to me after the service and he thanked me for the sermon. And then he told me he had been a shepherd. He'd watched sheep when he was younger and told me all the things I had said wrong about being a shepherd. So I'm very humble now about what I say about this. All this is to say, no offense meant to being a shepherd, but going from 
a prince in the court of Pharaoh to watching sheep all by yourself in a barren wilderness for decades. And they weren't even his own sheep. He was watching his father-in-law sheep. When you're 80 years old, do you want to be working for your father-in-law? What a come down. Now, of course, Moses did get to become a leader of a people, but who did he become a leader of? Of a nation of slaves. And then even when he got to do great miracles and lead the people out of Egypt, how did those people treat him? Again and again and again, we just can't believe as we read the stories that they keep doing it, but the Israelites keep rebelling. They keep disobeying him. They keep challenging his authority again and again. He was treated horribly by his own people. Moses accepted so much loss, loss of power, loss of privilege, loss of respect, loss of honor. And he never received recompense in this life, did he? Did he end his life marching into the promised land at the head of a great army? No, he ended up dying all by himself in the plains of Moab. He didn't receive recompense in this present life. As Deuteronomy 34 verse 5 says, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. Moses' humility was certainly a great type of that of our Lord Jesus Christ, who humbled himself in service to the people of God. Well then, what does Christian humility look like? What can we say about that? Well, it looks like Christ. Of course, I should say, be very clear, while Christ's humble service was redemptive, it purchased our salvation. Of course, our humble service doesn't purchase anyone's salvation. But let's think for a moment about what our humility ought to look like. And I turn back to Philippians, and particularly Philippians 2, the opening verses, which speak about our conduct as Christians. What does our humility look like? First, it is servant-like. It is a humble service to which we are called. Note what Paul says in Philippians 2 verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In a sense, that's what a servant does. Servants don't have the liberty to tend to themselves, to take care of their own interests. This is our deal of an independent person, a free person. A servant, well, serves others. And this is what Paul calls us to do here. You might think of what Paul also said in Galatians 6 verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is what servants do. They bear burdens. A person who is fortunate enough to have a servant doesn't bear his own burden. He has a servant do it. But that's what we all are called to do as Christians. We bear one another's burdens. But to which fellow Christians do we offer our service? To whom do we offer to bear burdens? And here we come to a second characteristic of Christian humility, which is also the second characteristic of Christ's humility, is that we offer service even to our inferiors. Ordinarily, we think that servitude is only appropriate for some people, those who are maybe naturally lower, naturally inferior. And yet, Paul doesn't distinguish between the great or the small. He says in verse 3 of Philippians 2, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. This is a universal command to Christians. Count others more significant or more important than yourselves. Doesn't just say, treat those who are more important than you as more important than you. We treat all of our fellow brothers and sisters as more important than ourselves. This means that those who are great in this world, those who are accomplished in this world, those who are educated in this world, those who are powerful and strong in this world, They count others more significant than themselves. That is what it means to be in Christ-like service, Christ-like humility. In Mark chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus says, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. 
If you want to be first, you must be last and a servant. A third aspect of Christian humility, again, matching a third aspect of Christ's own humility, is that it accepts unjust loss. Our humble service accepts unjust loss. I would suggest that this is implicit and inevitable in what Paul is describing in verses 1 through 4. If we are to have the same mind, to be in full accord with one another, to forsake selfish ambition, to count others more significant than ourselves, to look to the interests of others, even beyond our own, you will have to accept unjust loss. You will have to give up things that are rightfully yours. You have to let things go. Now, of course, I hope it's of course, I'm not making any grand statement here about finding recourse to the law. If certain crimes are committed against you, I'm not denying that. That is an option, a good option for Christians in many circumstances. But as we seek to serve each other and put ourselves humbly in servitude to others, we will accept unjust loss. And finally, fourth, we will have to accept that recompense for this loss may only come in eschatological glory. Christ calls us not to put off recompense, to accept loss just for a small time, as if tomorrow he will make it good for us, or next week or next year he will make it good for us. Brothers and sisters, we can be sure that the Lord will provide everything we need in this present life. He will shower blessings upon us far beyond what we can imagine. But that does not mean, that is not a promise that as we give up many things for the sake of serving the body of Christ, that we will give up many things that we will never see again in this life. As the Lord put it in Revelation 2 verse 10, Christians must be faithful unto death, and for this they receive the crown of life. That is what we have our eye on. It is not upon a reward in this present life. There's a certain person that is mentioned later in Philippians 2, a man by the name of Epaphroditus. We know very, very little about him. What we do know is that he was a member of the Philippian church, and they sent him to Paul to help Paul, to be a servant to Paul when they themselves couldn't do it personally. And Epaphroditus became ill, and Paul, one of the reasons he's writing to the Philippians is to assure them that he's okay. He hasn't died. And one of the things that he says about Epaphroditus, he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. This is what we do in service to one another. We even risk our own lives. We put our very selves on the line for one another, knowing that as our Lord said in Matthew 5, that our reward is great in heaven. Let me mention one final aspect of Christian humility. This is something that I didn't mention with respect to Christ earlier, but it's something that I believe needs to be said if we are to round out and complete this topic. Christian humility shuns self-promotion. Now, it's interesting, back in Philippians 2, verse 3, one of the terms, the Greek terms, that Paul uses as something that we need to avoid is kenodoxia, which translated very literally is vain glory. I believe that's how the King James translates this text. Now, vain glory is one of the old classical vices, one of the great vices that the Christian tradition has understood to be a great enemy of the Christian life. Vain glory is seeking glory in vain. It is seeking recognition, praise, adoration from our fellow human beings. A vain, glorious person doesn't even really care if he or she deserves it. What a vain, glorious person wants is glory. And that, Paul is teaching quite clearly here, is the opposite of humility. 
And here I think it is appropriate to reflect for a moment about the opening of Matthew chapter 6, which takes us into the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. There, Jesus warned his hearers not to practice righteousness before men. Don't do your good deeds before others. He says, don't sound the trumpet before you. You're about to do a good deed? Don't make loud noises trying to call attention to it. Of course, even as we examine our hearts and we recognize our own temptations to do things like that, we can very easily recognize how shameful that sort of thing is. But if we read just those first two verses of Matthew 6, we might see a way out. Okay, I'm not going to try to practice my good deeds before man. I'm not going to blow the trumpet before me. But maybe other people are going to recognize and see my good deeds, and they're going to praise me to others. Right? That would seem to be the best of all possible worlds, isn't it, for us sinners? You see what I'm saying here? If you don't brag about yourself, but other people see you and brag about you, I mean, this is what we all want. So then we have to keep reading, and we read the next couple of verses in Matthew 6, and what does Jesus say? He says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't be satisfied just with not blowing the trumpet before you. He says, be proactive in trying to keep other people from seeing the good deeds that you do. There's no easy way out of this. It is not just that we don't seek the limelight, but we actually take steps to avoid it. I'm sure that self-promotion has always been a temptation, a danger for Christians, but certainly in our own age, what a heightened danger it is when it is so easy and we are so encouraged to promote ourselves, to sing our own praises, to manipulate our own image. Yet if we seek to be humble as Christ has called us to be humble, we will not seek our own glory. In fact, we will not let our left hand know what our right hand is doing. But let me close on this note. The virtue of Christian humility the humility of service to one another is tremendously liberating. It's difficult. It means sacrificing many things that we would like to have. And yet, what a liberating virtue it is. How much time we spend in our lives trying to please other people. How much effort we expend trying to impress people, trying to make a good impression how much time we spend trying to manage our reputation. And yet Christ comes and says, you don't have to do that. You ought not to do that. Be satisfied, as Jesus says in Matthew 6, that your Father in heaven sees your good works. Be satisfied with humble service in the image of your Savior, knowing that your heavenly Father who sees in secret is more than capable of recognizing that of seeing that you receive full recompense on the last day. And surely the praise of our Heavenly Father is worth far, far more than the praise of a multitude of our fellow human beings. Thank you. break from our program, I'd like to bring to your attention a few bits of news from the Center for Christian Living. First, we're starting a new initiative in our podcast where we want to hear from and interact with listeners like you. Many of you have burning ethical questions or scenarios that you'd like advice about, and we'd love to hear from you. Send us your issues and listen out for an answer in our upcoming episodes where we'll begin to feature a short segment on your ethical challenges. You can send them through to us through our contact page on our website. Second, our next event in our series on A Virtuous Life is coming up on August 30th. In an age when authenticity, personal potential, and the fulfillment of that potential is so highly valued, the virtue of self-control seems counterintuitive. In contrast to the world, the Bible tells us that the good life is not located 
in unbounded self-expression, but in purposeful self-restraint. Why is self-control so necessary to the Christian life? What does the Bible have to say about it, and how can we cultivate it within ourselves? Come and hear more from Moore College lecturer David Honey as he speaks on the virtue of self-control. All the details and registration are available on our website, and as always, the event is free. Now let's get back to our program. Would you please join me in thanking Professor David Van Drunen. I'm really grateful for you, really looking forward to the next part of this evening. We're really glad for those of you that have joined us online. I'll pray. Heavenly Father, how wonderful it is to think on Christ and his humility. We pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you would help us to have the mind of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. benefit for more resources from the Center for Christian Living, please visit ccl.more.edu.au, where you'll find a host of resources, including past podcast episodes, videos from our live events, and articles published through the Center. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast and for you to leave us a review so more people can discover our resources. On our website, we also have an opportunity for you to make a tax-deductible donation to support the ongoing work of the Center. We always benefit from receiving questions and feedback from our listeners, so if you'd like to get in touch, you can email us at ccl at more.edu.au. As always, I would like to thank Moore College for its support of the Center for Christian Living, and to thank my assistant Karen Beelharts for her work in editing and transcribing the episodes. The music for our podcast was generously provided by James West.